Hi there everybody, I'm Fred Thomas and you are watching All Things Bike. And today we are speaking with Jim Tassie, Assistant Director and Advocacy Director at the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Fred. I'm thrilled to be here. Hey, anytime. <laughs> we're, we're thrilled to have you. We've got the legislative uh, expert, um, which is you. Um, we, have, uh, we have the guy who is working, doing the hard work on, on advocacy and all of this. So um, tell us exactly what the BCM's role is when it comes to advocacy and, and working with the legislature. Yeah, well, in general, the Bicycle Coalition of Maine is the state's leading and, in fact, really only uh, bicycle and pedestrian advocacy and education um, outfit. Okay. Uh, so, you know, you know we do events. We run education programs statewide uh, in partnership with the DOT um, on and off-road. We do some stuff um, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some RTP and Quimby funding that uh, keeps us uh, on the dirt as well. Okay. Um, and uh, advocacy-wise, we're, um, you know, really just trying to do whatever we can to make bicycling and walking mm -hmm. um, completely acceptable and understood modes of travel and recreation on right. Maine's roads. Then, so how, how do you do that? I mean, what is the nitty gritty process of, of advocacy? So many things, so many things. Um, you know, in, I, I'm gonna start generally and narrow down yeah, to yeah. legislative stuff. So uh, on a general sense, probably our most significant advocacy effort is coordinating what we call our community spokes program. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a, a core of about 160 people sprinkled across the state who go through a full day training with us about community mobilization. Um, and then we talk about how to change uh, a community using what we call programs, right. um, um, policies, and projects. Mm -hmm. So programs are kind of short-term things like a bike rodeo or an educational presentation, a lunch and learn right. a presentation at school. Policy work is just what it sounds like. We do a lot of work trying to um, advocate for complete street policies, which are policies that make sure that the needs of all users of a roadway are considered when mm -hmm. work is done on it. Right. And project advocacy is around actually those changes to the built environment, hardscape right. stuff. Right. So at the legislative level... So, so that, that, okay. was, that was all the community spokes. That was the, the programs that you have where you, you're working in the, in the local towns and there's some uh, representatives or volunteers really um, who, who volunteer to, to turn up at the town meeting and, and, and ask for, uh, for what, um, traffic calming procedures. That's, traffic calming, uh, yeah. uh, you know, Anything that better means. accommodation, um, right. you know, more investment from the town. But right. yeah, you're exactly right. The idea is that we get locals going right. in and having the conversations. I'm the most predictable person right. imaginable in meeting. You know, people know what I'm going to say, but when we get locals going in and talking to their, uh, you know, immediate decision makers. Um, right, it's totally different. Totally different. Right, so those are the programs that, uh, um, that the BCM supports. It's known as community spokes or imagine people here, or these kinds of. So imagine people here is, uh, is another kind of wing of the advocacy uh, world. It's sort of somewhere, but we are gonna okay. talk about that a little well, later. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna get to that. So uh, we'll get to that. So let's, um, so we got a sense about programs, but legislation, I mean, policy is, it, yeah. policy is, is a complex stuff. I and mean, when you see a, a bill and it, that comes out of the legislature, it's hard to read, it's long, it's dense. And, and and I'm wondering whether you guys are up there in the, in Augusta, wandering around the halls of, of of the Capitol, sort of trying to talk to people directly, or are you involved in um, uh, working on the bills? I mean, give us a sense of the of the of how you get your hands dirty in this process. So, in every legislative session since I've worked for the Bicycle Coalition, and I came on in 2010, uh, we have actually, um, you know, identified sponsors and developed legislation. Mm -hmm. um, that, that we were kind of behind and, and really trying to work through. Right. Um, so that's one thing that we do, and we're going to talk about two bills today that yep. you know, we were kind of the, um, the, the driving force behind. Mm -hmm. um, but we also just monitor uh, the kinds of bills that are being proposed in the legislature, and when appropriate, we testify on them and offer comments. And that can be just writing a written kind of uh, testimony that so we want to get on the record having made a recommendation. Right. If it's something we're really, really um, concerned about or supportive of, mm -hmm. we will go and testify in person. Right, right. So there, there's a stream of, of bills on some website somewhere. And, and is it your job to sit there and sort of watch them sort of pop up? Or, or do you have someone up there in Augusta? Or? Well, so it, me. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, right. So I'm, I'm a registered. So myself and uh, John Williams, the uh, oh, okay. executive director, we both register as lobbyists with the 
state of Maine because as soon as you right. go over eight hours in any given month, you, yeah. you have to kind of report that time. Right. Um, we do get up to the legislature uh, a good amount. Um, mm -hmm. We're not up there every single day simply because it's not the only thing that we're doing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we've got um, a couple of legislators, a bunch of legislators who've worked with, with us in the past who are supportive of the mission. Right. And, um, you know, we work with them and actually let them do a lot of the legislative advocacy, you Networking. know, at, at the actual uh, do, do, do I've always wondered, do, uh, do um, any or many of the legislatures, legislators, do they, do they ride? I mean, can you, can you go up there and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to be here, let's go for a ride and talk about the bill you're working on? Or, um, or is that not? Really you know, th works? those guys don't have time. So to your first question, think, you know, yeah. who's, who's reading all the titles of bills? So yeah. th the legislators this year had to deal with almost 2,000 bills. Wow. And so I personally read about, I think that the final number was something like 1895. I read 1895, wow. 1,895 titles. And what we do is we try to identify the ones that, you know, seem to have some sort of um, impact with our mission and work. Wow. Um, so yeah, those guys job. don't have a yeah. lot of time yeah, yeah. dealing with all that, that stuff to get out. We do, in every legislative session, um, go up and do what we call bike walk day at the Capitol. And this year we actually were up there with a fleet of um, electric assist bicycles yeah, uh, provided by yeah. Gorham Bike and Ski. Yeah. And um, we did have, you know, we, we hung out up there for a few hours and, you know, we probably had, you know, 15 legislators over the course of the day take a little chop on them. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and what was the response? I mean, do they, were they enlightened or were they, I mean, what was, how did they... They were enlightened, and, and, you know, pretty much my experience is, and I came at e-bikes a bit of a skeptic, but I'm, yeah. uh, you know, I'm now a complete convert. Yeah, right. Everyone comes back with a big smile and they go like, wow. And, uh, yeah. you know, the neat thing about e-bikes is, um, you know, they're not a replacement to my bike. They're a replacement to my car. Yeah. You know, it's like that's what's really cool about the e-bike. If you need to do errands and run around a little bit, um, you know, the number of times where I opt to take the e-bike rather than take my car, right. it's really beyond count at this point. Wow, that's great. So it, it's a, it complements your bike, replaces your car. And, um, and uh, I guess it really, it, it's like air conditioning. Once you start using it, you never go back. Yeah. Yeah. Can it, can it, is it at that point yet? Maybe not. But uh, you know, it it, uh, it it really depends what I'm doing. I mean, I still yeah. like to ride, you know, uh, an unassisted bicycle just for you know pure yeah, fitness right, and right, pure right. recreation. But um, you know, for work purposes, if I know I need to zip around Portland, do yep. a bunch of um, yeah, yeah, errands, yeah. it's like you know I can show up and not be drenched in sweat. Sure. Yeah. Um, so it's uh, they're, they're really they're really neat. So every every session we do something to try and get legislators out, you know, walking or biking. Right. Uh, and this year, because we had LD twelve twenty two, right. the electric assist bike bill, um, we were focusing on that. Well, let's dive into that one. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot going on there. Um, um, why don't you start with with what what it what it's what it was intended to do? Def define was the key word, right? Um, right. So. Prior to the passage of LD uh, 1222, and LD just, it means legislative documents. So it's just, it's just the jargon they use right. up there. It just means a bill. Um, prior to the passage of that bill, uh, e-bikes were not defined in Maine law. Or, and to the extent that they were, they were not describing what a contemporary electric assist bicycle is. And so we were actually approached by People for Bikes, which is a national bicycle advocacy group, and they wanted to know if we would work with them to try and, you know, basically rationalize um, Maine's law around e-bikes, um, mm -hmm. define what they were, clarify, you know, the, the, the various types of e-bikes, right. and then define where they could and could not ride. Right. And we were more than happy to do that. Um, yeah, well, um, so the result was we've got three classes now. Um, Correct. Uh, class one is is assisted electric bike up to 20 miles an hour. Uh, give us describe if you can the, the you know the the distinctions. Sure. So there there are three classes. Yep. Uh, so or, or types. Um, right. Kind of used interchangeably. But so class one is uh, pedal assist up to 20 miles per hour. Right. Type two is on demand up to 20 miles per hour. So that's like just a throttle. You just twist in a throttle. And, uh, and then there's a, a class three e-bike or a type three e-bike, which is pedal assist only up to 28 miles per hour. Right. And that, um, you know, those speed values are set to kind of coincide with um, international, right. um, you know, kind of Standards. metric specs on, on, yeah, on yeah. speed. Yeah. 
Right, and then and um, so that that helped clear things up quite a bit. Yeah. Um, then they also uh, they go into the whole usage about where you can ride an e-bike and where you can't, and and it gets pretty ing ambiguous, don't you think? Uh, or or is it clearer now than it was before? I mean, I couldn't quite tell. It, <laughs> <laughs> well, like, as, as you said, some of the stuff that comes out of the legislature yeah. is a, a little difficult to read sometimes. Yeah, uh, we do think it's a little clearer, and yeah. it's 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 a little bit. It makes a lot more sense. So. Um, the, the class one and class two e-bikes mm -hmm. are permitted anywhere a normal unpowered or unassisted bicycle is permitted right. except for a, a single track mountain bike trail. Right. And um, a class three e-bike is only permitted <clears throat> excuse me, on uh, on-road facilities. So no multi-use paths for a, a, right. a class so three a bike. bike lane, basically. Bike lane is fine. The in the road is fine. Yeah, yeah. 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 Something that's in a roadway right of way. Right. And then the, um, uh, the, the carve out, for, and, and in, in the case of, you know, the class one and class two uh, e-bikes on facilities, mm -hmm. the local um, facility manager still has the option of saying no. Yeah, you know, exactly. Maine is big on local control, so we wanted yeah. to, you know, give people the opportunity to exercise right. that control if they wanted and that was really very important for the mountain bike yeah, uh, trail. Yeah, elaborate on that because when you read the bill it goes into usage and then it, it says um, um, class three something about gravel and, and wooden bridges and, and stuff like that and, and it sounded like the carriage trails to me but but um, but I don't think so. I think it's they're talking no, about mountain bikes. Uh, uh, and, and so the, the reason we uh, decided to um, basically follow the lead of the New England Mountain Bike Association mm -hmm. that had been working with people for bikes in other states in mm -hmm. the region. Uh, and, and they're not really keen on e-bikes on single track trails. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we, it, out of respect for, sure. you know, NEMBA and, and really not wanting to get into a, a, a big fight about this, I mean, this seemed to be a rational thing that we could get behind. Um, but what we did is we created, again, a local option. So it is very possible and, you know, we, we think and hope that uh, people will mm -hmm. permit e-bikes on some trails. Um, uh, but, you know, there were land trusts that were concerned, um, right, yeah. you know, places like the Eastern Trail Alliance, those guys were a little concerned. But the, 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 the critical distinction is natural surface. Um, so a, a, a trail that is mostly a natural surface right. that is not coated, like so the carriage trails, for example, are coated with that fine aggregate kind of stone dusty stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually sets it into a different class. That's and right. the Eastern Trail also has, a, it, I mean, yeah. it's a natural material, but it's not natural to that place. Yeah, right. Um, and so the, uh, the, the distinction is really if you're dealing with kind of like, you know, the dirt that's underneath, uh, you know, the uh, the vegetative matter. Yeah. That's what kind of distinguishes yeah, yeah. Uh, a mountain bike trail from some other facility. Yeah. You know, it, it's always a bit of an imperfect process um, passing legislation, and right. uh, I think that we had actually a better sort of, you know, way to distinguish and and accurately yeah. describe what a mountain bike trail is, but we felt that the language that finally came through was... Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I th yeah, I mean, I think it, it's probably uh, much clearer than it was before, yeah. um, and, and that's, that's progress. Well, um, uh, let's move on to the, the other bill that you were working on, which was related to um, handheld um, devices or mobile phones and, and distracted driving. So um, that actually wasn't a bill that we initiated. So LD1222 is one that we initiated. Right. Yeah, and the, um, this, is, this is a more a general thing. It's not yeah. specifically to bikes, but it certainly affects cyclists and, wa and pedestrians. Because yeah, so LD-165, mm -hmm. um, sponsored by Bill Diamond out of um, Wyndham, right. uh, basically makes you know, holding a device in your hand while you're driving illegal. It doesn't matter if you're typing, yeah. talking, right. swiping, you can't have it in your hand. And that was driven partly because um, Law enforcement found it extremely difficult to enforce laws around text messaging because, you know, how do you know if that person is navigating, which is still kind of a carved yeah. out category. But even under the new law, which is, it is law, it is uh, it Yeah, it was passed just passed, time. yeah. Yeah, June 27th, the governor signed it. Mm -hmm. um, you, you can't hold it in your hand. Mm -hmm. So it's like if you can mount it on your dashboard and you don't have to interact with it, you know, too much, mm -hmm. that's... Uh, Permissible, That's okay, but but know this, know this. Right. Put your yeah. phone down and drive. 
Well, that's that's great. I mean, it's um, it, it's the drunk driving of the 21st century, and, and um, any anything that that helps reduce. The, I mean, it's good for drivers too. I mean, that's that's um, people sort of lose sight of that. I and mean, you can certainly crash your car into another car if you're on your phone. Um, and you know, the, the cyclist's risk is a whole another thing. But exactly. it's very easy to enforce now. I mean, even I can spot a driver who's who, who's got a phone in their hand. So, uh, and does that is that making cyclists um, or is the bicycle coalition? Um, I mean, obviously they're very happy, but but um, did they did they um, do anything to, to help or advance it? In some way? Uh, well, we, you know, we did in fact um, offer oral testimony. We actually rallied a bunch of people right. up for that one, and so um, we had a couple of people uh, who who offered in person testimony. Yeah. Um, we actually made some suggestions. There were actually two bills that were trying to do very similar things. Mm -hmm. And um, Bill Diamond's bill actually started out with lower fine thresholds than the other bill. Yep. And we really advocated for a higher set of fines for right. you know, even your first offense. So right. Good. You, you start with a $250 fine. Second fine is $500 and suspension. And it gets, uh, yeah, it gets yeah. longer and more expensive from there. Yeah, well, um, that's that's great. Well, um, the the third um, bill that you were working on was uh, related to providing traffic safety education to K through eight. That's correct. Students, um, elaborate on on that. So that was LD four seventy. We call that the Traffic Safety Education Act. That was sponsored by Maddie Daughtry. Oh yeah. Um, who is a, a good friend of the coalition and, and LD twelve twenty two. I should give a shout out to Dean Rikerson, who was the sponsor for that bill. Both of those legislature legislators are members of our. Um, policy and legislation committee. So they've, they they work pretty closely with us and have right. for uh, a couple, you know, a few years now. Um, but LD four seventy it uh, would require a minimum of four hours of mm -hmm. basic traffic safety education between kindergarten and grade eight. That was the final amended compromise right. language that moved forward. Um, Per, for per year or for the whole K through eight. So our original plan was that you would get one hour in every grade from grade two through twelve. The the the, you know, the, the transportation. I'm mean, sorry. The education committee dialed that back. So it's uh, mm -hmm. over the course of you know the K through eight, which is you know nine years. Mm -hmm. um, there have to be four separate one-hour sessions. It's really not a lot. No, it's not. But it's, uh, it's a place to begin. And the hope is that if we can get this on the books, um, you know, maybe we can expand it. People will see value in it. Mm -hmm. um, right now, that bill is um, stalled in the Appropriations Committee. It has a, a $70,000 fiscal note that's attached to it. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're working with the Appropriations Committee to see if there's a, a way to move that forward, that'll get decided probably next right. spring when they, uh, when they go through what's called the appropriations table right, right. and unfunded bills then get see a little, they, get a little see taste. See if there's money. Yeah, well, um, just very quickly, how would that um, bill manifest itself in a school? Would it, would it be a, the, the two o'clock class from two to three or, or would it be the Bicycle Coalition coming in and doing a presentation? Uh, either or. So, um, you know, we, like I mentioned that we're already running education programming right. across the state. So we've got about, you know, 25 people that we send into schools all over the state. Um, you know, at, at over the last year, we're, like I said, about 10,000 face-to-face presentations. Wow. Uh, it takes about 50 minutes. Um, but the bill, uh, you know, certainly makes it possible to bring in the third party. I mean, but it also enables teachers to be trained and to deliver that content themselves. And, right. um, you know, the, the challenge with our programs, even though that we're, we're reaching, you know, quite a lot of people, it only represents about 10% of the, the total school age population. Mm -hmm. And it was really something that we're, you know, we're only giving these presentations at the places that we're asking for it. And mm -hmm. the goal behind the legislation was to make it more uniform, more consistent, right. more people are getting it. Um, we have a ready-made curriculum. It's very easy to learn and teach the curriculum, particularly if you're at all bike savvy. Right. right. Um, well, that's great. Well, um, yeah. let's we, let's move on to um, the, um, the the programs. Imagine people here um, demonstration campaigns because that that is that's a, a in a way related to um, uh, you know it's one of the things that BCM does. And you sent along some pictures. Yeah. Uh, Cottage Road. This is Cottage Road. This is the first project that we did. So this this program started out as Imagine Bikes Here. Okay. And um, it is part of a, a movement, really, 
nationally and internationally that's referred to as tactical urbanism, which is um, a, a phrase that was co actually coined by uh, Mike Lydon, who grew up in Dermascotta. So Mainer actually invented that term, which is right. kind of a cool detail. Um, and the idea behind tactical urbanism is that you, instead of you know, showing people what the road could look like you know, with a bike lane or with curb mm -hmm. extensions by viewing um, you know, blueprints or photo simulations, mm -hmm. you actually go out and, and execute yeah. a version of that. And well, so I think the next image shows that. This first one uh, we did uh, just with an athletic uh, line striper. Um, Mm -hmm. And this family, uh, you know, we had just finished painting it, and they were like, yay, bike lane. It's easy. And yeah. they jumped right into it. So. Well, what about the, um, the, the, the version that you did up in Madawaska? I think that was a, a, something related to the curb, right? That was a pedestrian facility. Okay. So up in Madawaska, what we did is, uh, and I don't know if you this was a place uh, right in front of a school where there was a crossing mm -hmm. that went from, you know, a, a, basically a sidewalk into a parking lot. And yeah. That is under Maine DOT uh, guidelines, you know, really not permitted. You're supposed to have a place right. of safe landing yep. at either end of a crosswalk. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we used temporary curb stop material and flexible bollards, delineators, yep. um, you know, kind of tubular yeah, things. flexible things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we, we used those to, to mark out a, uh, a safe landing so you mm -hmm. couldn't get a car in there because the curb stops prevented that. Right. And the flexible delineators called more attention to the crossing. And the principal was so impressed at the change in behavior on the part of drivers mm -hmm. that they bought the material um, immediately. And just set it right and up. Are there examples of that facility or, or tactical urbanism being used um, elsewhere in the state? Yeah, well, we've done... I mean, this year alone, we've done, I think we're up to seven projects. So I've got a project going oh. up in Brunswick. Uh, I've got, we, did, we actually painted a, a bikeway in Sanford, which included um, bike lanes on William Oscar Emery Drive, and then mm -hmm. a series of shared lane markings, or mm -hmm. sharrows, mm -hmm. that extend um, from William O. Emery Drive all the way to town. Mm -hmm. um, this image here is from an event called uh, Build Maine that's held in Lewiston. Uh -huh. And this is a, a pedestrian uh, facility again. This is a refuge island. Um, we created the little splitter that, that kind of uh, narrows the travel lane, put the flexible delineators up. Mm -hmm. And then using uh, the curb stop, we created, um, again, kind of a safe spot. So as a person's walking across this road, right. this happens to be Canal Street. Programs also extend into the mountain biking. Um, let's uh, talk about that briefly. I mean, you, Great. you've got, um, you're, you're working on, on uh, trails in Cape Elizabeth and Falmouth um, with the assistance of, of the Quimby uh, Foundation. Uh, elaborate on, on how that goes. So we have a program that we call the ORB program, the Off-Road mm -hmm. Bicycling Education Program, and that has two components. One is teaching people how to ride trails safely, mm -hmm. and the other component is how to build sustainable trails on the uh, the IMBA kind of design standards, uh -huh. um, you know, so we're offering a lot of educational programming around the state. Bangor's got a lot going on. There's some going on in Millinocket. Um, we've been doing some training of bike shop staff so that because more and more bike shops are offering instruction um, mm -hmm. for mountain biking, and so we've trained up um, a few shops so that they have uh, the wherewithal to to teach people according to what are called. PIMBY standards, the Professional Mountain Bike okay. Instructors Association. Yeah, there is such a thing. And how about these guys? Um, these are. Is this the? This is the Cape Elizabeth. So this school. is the uh, the other part of the ORB program is uh, trail design and construction, and this is a group of uh, Cape Elizabeth uh, lacrosse players and a couple of football players who helped uh, support a machine built project, the first machine built project, mm -hmm. um, really kind of in southern Maine. Um, uh, in uh, the Winnick Woods area of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, it is a very smooth, windy trail that yeah. is designed to be um, you know, usable by low-skill riders. It's really right. kind of an entry-level facility, mm -hmm. but it's also used by people who are walking uh, and skiing oh, okay. and snowshoeing as well. So it's not a, yeah, yeah. Not, well, it's kind of hard to get permission to do things that are just bike-specific in sure, some yeah, communities. Of course. Yeah, and, well, uh, so this gets a ton of use by all kinds of people. This is another example. We were not quite 
even done, and these kids were riding along, and they, you know, they found the smooth stuff, and they're like, yeah, we're on this. This is great. And, and you, you were able to get in, um, the excavator equipment to, to speed the project along. And, and we hired a guy named uh, Jeremy Nellis, mm -hmm. who works with, uh, his, his company's called uh, Wondrous Trails, and he is a trail designer mm -hmm. and builder. Uh, did a lot of work up in Gould Academy's trail system, uh, Bethel area. He's done stuff all over the state, and he's got an excavator that you could just about balance on this table. Right, right, right. It's a teeny little Specific. thing that just winds between the trees. It and makes it happen. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, one last point. Um, how do people get involved with the BCM? Well, you know, the first and best way to support us is to become a member. Um, so please uh, uh, consider uh, signing up. If you ride a bike on-road or off-road, we're doing what we can to give you more options and make it safer. Um, Beyond that, you know, we've got lots of volunteer opportunities. Okay. Um, if you have a business and you're looking to do kind of a team building event, we're starting to do more and more of that sort of thing. We have our, some of our business membership partners, uh, you know, get involved with us because they want us to identify trail work days or hold a, um, you know, uh, you know, learn how to work on your bike session at the workplace. So. Um, there's lots of ways to get involved. Great. It begins with membership, and uh, I hope people join. Uh, they will. All right, Jim. Well, thanks so much. All right, everybody. That was Jim Tassie, the Assistant Director and Advocacy Director at the Bicycle Coalition of Maine. You can learn more about the BCM on their Facebook page online. Thanks so much for watching. That's all we have time for. We'll talk to you again soon.